Okay. Started. How's everybody doing? In the same size since last Friday, which is good. We still have about 12 people. Um, Friday, which is nice. Okay, so any questions about the first two sessions so far? So just to recap, the first session, which seemed, which was just last week, 29th, it's in, it's, at least it's in my, the sort of the table I'm in. So, um, yeah, so the first, just to recap briefly, the first time we sort of did a review of basic MATLAB commands, hopefully you guys learned some new MATLAB commands in that process. We talked about style a little bit, we talked about debugging, about functions, writing functions, messy functions. Last time we talked about sort of simulating data with noise, OD15S versus 45, um, but compartmental modeling after. And um, so any questions about any of the concepts thus far? Um, did you guys try the practice problems so far for lecture one or for lecture two? Yeah, no, no, okay, so I won't go through it today then. I would recommend um, looking at the practice problem from lecture two, it demonstrates a very important concept about ODE solvers. Um, and then in the future, in one of the future sessions, I'll also again ask you whether you did it in lecture two. Um, so the first problem set, as you guys noticed, is out. And um, just wanted to point out here that there are some files that are required for the first problem set in part C of the MATLAB, and they're uploaded on um, OpenEdX. There's, there are four questions in the MATLAB, which are in coursework. I know it's a little bit scattered, but hopefully it'll be clear. If not, there are some reference readings. Um, and so just to give a brief overview of the first problem set really quickly, it will go through pretty much everything we're gonna cover in sort of the first unit. So we haven't done all of it yet, but I would encourage you to get started on part A, because that mostly deals with ODE solvers. Hopefully it'll be fun, hopefully. Have you guys done the hodgkin ASCII model before? Have you done like modeling of it in MATLAB? Okay, okay, so please don't, I guess, look at that old problem set when you're doing this new problem set, right? Try and do it from scratch so that you really understand what's going on. Um, hopefully it will, so the way the problem set is written, it won't only be just about putting these equations in a differential equation solver, but rather really understanding where they came from, what they sort of mean for physiology. And then parts B and C of the problem set would, we hope, I mean, I'm pretty sure you haven't seen that because I wrote those problems completely from scratch, is, uh, would be dealing with, um, sort of doing parameter estimation from some of the data that was actually in one of the hodgkin Oxley papers and also some data that I simulated. Some of it we'll be doing today in terms of taking data from the lead. I'll be showing you how to do that and trying to model it. So hopefully, if once you're through the end of it, I think you would, um, I hope that you would learn a lot. Uh, that's the intention. Uh, you would get to practice a wide variety of skills, I think, in MATLAB by the end of the first problem set. Start early, it is a long problem set. The math lab especially is pretty long. So start early, I would encourage it. For the math lab? Yeah. <laughs> okay. But I'm here, you know, just email me or ask on Piazza, come to office hours. Okay, so let's start talking about, so today we have two goals. One is I'm gonna show you briefly what Data Thief looks like. You'll be using that for the first problem set too. The neat software, people from last year told me that they used it over and over again and they really like it. Thought I might as well do a quick demo of it. I'm gonna talk about linear parameter estimation, something that you don't explicitly use in the first problem set, but something which is very good to know anyway. Some of you may have seen it before in the different courses. I just wanted to make sure that everybody has 
So firstly, data thief, um, um, you can just go to Google, type data thief, download it. It's pretty much a hack. It looks like a hack. And the idea with this is that you can take a plot from the literature and you can specify coordinate axes on it, specify data trace that you want, and it'll give you a nice little table of values corresponding to that trace, and then you can do stuff with it. Right? Okay. So that's the basic gist of it. And so here's a paper that we actually used last year in the course. Right? And this paper, just briefly, was about um, it's a science paper from 2012, which was about, so you know about these temperature sensitive channels called TRP channels? I'm not sure. They're basically channels that, you know, which would sort of go off at a certain temperature different depending on the kind of channel you're looking at, the temperature that they go off on. And they're sort of involved in like the way you sense sort of menthol. The, that menthol has a cooling effect, for example, that comes from these channels. There are a lot of examples. They regulate temperature. So what this paper did was that they modified these channels to sort of express a domain, which a domain expressed on these iron oxide nanoparticles will bind to. Right? So you have these nanoparticles binding to these channels. And then, and then you can heat up the nanoparticles, right, using radio waves. And then when you heat them up, because these are temperature sensitive channels, these temperature sensitive channels will selectively go off, right? And then when they go off, then you can have downstream effects of that. So, so it's an interesting paper with some, um, and so what we want to do here is um, go to the sub, for example, right, of this paper. Say, say you're just reading this paper, you're interested in sort of modeling what's going on. You go down, you see this plot here, which represents the use nanoparticles of different sizes, right? And you're figuring out sort of, um, you want to be able to model, right, these traces as they look, right? You, you think that it's within your grasp to be able to come up with a model, estimates and parameters in MATLAB from this. And so something you do, I don't know how to do this in Mac, but you could do something like, you know, just literally go in and Then you can go to this software called Data Thief, which looks like this. And up here, right? This is what this looks like now. And so what Data Thief, the first thing you do for to get data out of a plot will be specifying the axes, right? So how do you specify axes? You see that there are three reference points, ref0, ref1, ref2. So you go on to ref0. It, and this is so zero comma zero, for example. Okay, I said that zero comma zero. So basically, what I did was I picked zero comma zero, and I click on, when I click on top on ref zero, then it sets that as the coordinate axis, and I've specified the numbers here. Then I say ref two should be twenty comma zero or zero comma twenty. So I said that here somewhere around there. Okay, so that's fine. And then I want my ref one to be. And these numbers you could adjust. So if I wanted 800 comma zero, I could drag this blue point over to here, and then set it. That's that. Now I have my axes. Okay. Then another thing I want to point out: if you go into the axis option, you can sort of, if you don't have a linear x-axis, linear y-axis, you can tell data thief all these things. The default assumption is that both axes are linear, but you can tell it. Okay. So now you. Does that make sense? That you know, if this axis is not linear, the way that it's going to calculate, if it's a log axis, then it can calculate that axis accordingly, right? It can calculate all the data values accordingly. So you do that. So that's as far as axes is concerned. Let's talk about the data trace now. So to specify the data trace, I have a start point, right, which is the green. I have the end point, which is the red, and then I have a color marker, which is in the blue. So say I want to model just this down going part of the trace here starting, so for the 25 nanometer curve as it's decaying down, I want to just model that part of the data set. So I get that, specify the start point, the arrow sort of the direction of the trace, right? this arrow here associated with the green marker. Then I specify, put the blue on top of the color, and then I specify some sort of end. So say I want to end here. Here there's also important to remember that you can so, for example, trace this, right? 
And you see the black line? Is that sort of visible? And it's not. Well, let me, so I'm going to switch to this view where I can see actually, now these are all data points that I have along this line. So pretty straightforward. And sometimes, um, sometimes what will happen, a common error would be that, you know, you can imagine that if there are a lot more traces, this is fairly straightforward, right? You know, you, know, you can see the line here. Sometimes the plots you're getting, they're very complicated and data, tree, you know, if there's a plot coming up here, you can imagine the data thief might get confused and it'll say if trace did not reach end point, right? And then this option will also be available to you, this option that says hint here. And the hint, what the hint is, is it's sort of like this green start um, point with the arrow. But it will, you will put it somewhere in the middle of your trace and it'll, you'll tell Data Thief, okay, this trace goes from here to here and sort of just help it along. And you can place in as many hints as you want till you get the trace as you desire, right? Does that make sense? So you have the hint option. And then there's another thing that you can do very nicely in Data Thief is you can specify here in the input distance sort of how many data points you want out. So if I said 10 here, that would mean that give me data points at a distance of 10 and then I'd retrace it and so you can see that there are many fewer data points now, as opposed to what was the case when the input distance was set to something like two, right? So give me data points now, at least. So I have many more data points in that case. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's just the X and Y coordinates. No, you can, I mean, you can switch them around too. If you wanted ref1 to be the y coordinate, you can sort of switch them around. It doesn't matter. They're just three different points because, I mean, they, you will t specify, right, which, um, uh, what the coordinates, x and y coordinates of the points are. So it doesn't even need to be necessarily that, you know, it can be some really, it doesn't need to be a Cartesian coordinate axis. It could be any axis, right? It's just the question of specifying any coordinate axis by three data points, right? Right, at the end of the day. Oh, I see. Rest here is the origin in this case, yep. Does that make sense? So, so far clear, everything about what's going on. So it's a, you know, quick way, if you want to test some hypothesis, you're wanting to play around with data, you can just use it. Um, and then, um, the way you bring in hints, just to, is this gray thing you see? So when you want to place in hints, you'll be able to just drag in some things from here. So this is a hint, actually. You see this, this is a data point with an arrow, so I can just place it on here, and make the arrow point towards here, that's a hint. So I can again trace it. Okay? Any questions? A hint is basically, so the idea is that if sometimes Data Thief may give you an error saying that it's not being able to trace it, it can't reach the end point from the start point, which means that there's, you know, say there was another gray line going like this here in this plot, right? You can imagine that Data Thief will be wanting to trace it along that direction then, and so it'll lose sight of this trace. So if you put a hint from here to here, telling it that this is the direction of the trace you want to go in, then it will follow that. That's the hint, right? And you can place in as many hints, and the hint looks like that point with that little arrow coming off of it, and so you can place in as many hints as you want to get the trace finally. This is a relatively simple data set, but um, actually, in the problem set, when you get data out, you might encounter this problem, and then you'll have to place in hints to like get the entire data tree. Particularly with old figures, right? 1950 papers, you might have to do this. Um, so, okay, so then, moving on. Final step, export data, right? Okay. File export data. And I save it as a text file here, okay? Is that cool? It has radio wave heating one dot text, okay? And then in MATLAB, I, I saved it in this directory, so it's just a list really of, with the x-axis telling me time points, this was in seconds, the y-axis telling me delta t, the temperature differences, that was the y-axis in that case. And if you want to just load this file as is, I would just remove this line at top, because otherwise MATLAB will cause some funky problems with loading the text. You could probably write some functions to remove that too, but anyways, so. Now you have a nice little list of data points, right? You can work with this. And we're gonna come back to this and actually fit it using linear parameter estimation later today. Okay. Any questions about data? Okay. Linear parameter estimation. Um, so this is a huge topic and by no means do, 
the half an hour that we have today devoted to this topic will do justice to it, right? And so my idea is for people who've seen it, if they've not seen how to do this in MATLAB, they'll get a flavor for it. For other people also just, it's, there's a lot of math that goes in this. I'm not gonna go into all of the math, um, but the idea is just to sort of know about it, be aware about it, and be able to re read up on it later as required. So what's the general problem statement here? Is that, you know, we've all done this, right? You got some data, you put it in Excel, fit a line to it. We're gonna start digging deeper into what that process actually entails. And so that's what you're doing here. You acquired some data, you want to fit it to a linear model. We're gonna talk about what a linear model actually is, what that means. But before I do that, I just want to also say next week we'll be doing nonlinear parameter estimation, right? And there might be a feeling at the end of next week that why not just model everything using nonlinear models. There's a, and there are many advantages of using linear models. They're simple to implement, right? They have, in nonlinear models, as you'll see, or you may have experienced, you need some initial values for the parameters that you want to estimate, finally, right? You want to start, and we'll talk about this more next week, but in linear optimization, in linear regression, you don't need any initial values, right? There's no dependency on them. This, will, this point will become clearer next week, and also, each parameter that you estimate is itself a statistical variable. It itself has noise, right? And so if you remember last week, we talked about doing sensitivity analysis during MRS, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, and I talked about adding noise many, many times and then repeating parameter estimation each time. Um, that was because that was a nonlinear problem. In linear problems, you don't need to do that because you can actually just have formula. You have formulae that tell you how much is the noise in the parameters that you estimate. So you can compute error, errors in your parameter estimates analytically. Points, these points, just to keep in the back of your mind, they will become clearer later on. So now let's talk about what is a linear model. So a linear model, and this is just from your reading, which I would highly recommend doing for this week for sure, is just something where y, which is the so sort of the experimental measurement that you're making, can be expressed as a linear function of the unknown and up till beta n, note that your dependent variable, which is x, right, and these f1 of x, this does not need to be linear. So I could have beta 1 times sine t, where t is time, which is my independent variable, and I could have y is beta 1 sine t, for example, where y is sort of some measurements I've made on this sine wave. On this sine wave. That is still a linear model, because the linearity I'm checking for is the linearity in the parameter beta, as opposed to the linearity in the parameter, in the variable t. Does that make sense to everybody? That, so the linearity you're checking is for, um, that your experimental measurement is linear in parameters you want to estimate, not in the dependent variable. So f1 of x, f2 of x, et cetera, they could all be nonlinear in x, that doesn't matter. Does that make sense? So again, y is equal to mx plus c. That's like the equation of a straight line. We've all seen that, right? So m, the point is here that y is linear in m. x could be sine of t, log of t, exponential of t, I don't care. The linearity that I'm looking for here is in m. Okay? Then the other thing, so that's one thing, very important thing to know, what is a linear model? This is the definition right here, right? Next thing which is important to know is whenever you're doing linear regression, or in other words, estimation of parameters using a linear function, the number of linear equations is greater than the number of coefficients. So number of coefficients means here beta one through beta n, right? Just like m is a coefficient in the equation of a line. These are the number of coefficients. Number of linear equations would be the different values for y I have. How does this make sort of sense intuitively? Why would you do parameter estimation? You would do parameter estimation in a paradigm where you can't exactly solve all the linear equations you have, right? So you want to find, so, so you know that if you have three variables and three equations with those three variables, right, you can obtain an exact solution probably for those three variables. There are some conditions in which that doesn't hold, but, right? But if you have 10 different equations in those three variables, right, then it's unlikely that those, unless some of the equations are repeated, it's unlikely that certain values, uh, like one set of values for those three variables will satisfy all the 10 equations, right? Does that make sense? 
if you have 10 equations with three variables, right, unless some equations are rep repeated, you can't find a set of values for those three variables that satisfy all the equations. That's when regression comes in, right? Because what you're doing then is you're finding a set of values for those three variables which solve those 10 equations as closely as possible. Does that make sense? That's, that's, so that's what this means here. The number of linear equations m, or 10 in the example I gave, is greater than the number of coefficients 3, right, whose values we seek, right? This is the second thing, very, and this is called an overdetermined system of linear equations. So the second very important thing to know about, and this makes sense, right? When you, whenever you do your little linear fits in Excel, right, you have tons of data points, right, right? And you have one dependent variable, one independent variable. You're looking for two parameters usually, right? The slope and the intercept, right? When you're doing fits. So it is an overdetermined system, right? You have many, many data points, but only two parameters you want to estimate. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? Questions? Okay. Just definition. Okay. So if I want to represent this statement here, right? in matrix form, which would make our life a lot easier, and you know MATLAB is very good with matrices, so I'll show you what that looks like, but I could write something like this. Is this reasonable to everybody? Note that it's M here and N here, which means that I have, again, N coefficients, right? So we're just doing matrix multiplication here. So Y1 would be F1, X1 times beta 1 plus F2, X1 plus times beta 2 plus F3, X3, um, F3, X1 times beta 3 up till Fn, X1 times beta n, and so on. Basically, here the y was just representing one data point. I could have m data points, right? And I could write, is this, is this clear to everybody? Is this something that people feel comfortable with, this matrix notation? Ask questions if it's not very clear. Again, you're just doing matrix multiplication here. F1, X1 goes with beta 1. F2, X1, which will come here, will go with beta 2, and so on, right? And so you'll have m, m different linear equations, and you have n coefficients, okay? Is m greater than n or n greater than m in our case? m is greater than n, number of equations is greater than number of coefficients, right? So this matrix here, this will look what we call skinny as opposed to fat. Fat matrices look the other way around. So this matrix here will look skinny, okay? M is greater than N, okay? That's classic for linear regression. And so why that's useful is this thing, this whole thing, right? This seems like a lot here, is this, four characters, okay? Y is a vector, A is a matrix, and B is a vector, that's it. And I'm gonna give you the solution for this, and that's also going to look very simple in MATLAB, and we'll come to that. But, so, but generally, going back to what linear parameter estimation is, you know why? Why are experimental measurements that you've made, right? Why is sort of data that you've picked, right, that you measure, that you've acquired, A is some function of your dependent, uh, independent variable X, right? And so you know that as well. That's the assumption that linear parameter estimation makes. And all you want are values for these coefficients, or you want to know the vector b. Right? Is that fair? Everybody good so far? OK, that's all you're doing. Okay. So again, you want to choose a vector b such that a b approximates y as closely as possible, right? That makes sense to everybody? You can't get a perfect solution. You want the best you can do. And mathematically, and we'll come to why this is a little bit, is this is the way we talk about it. When we say this statement here intuitively, mathematically, we're saying minimize the sum of squared differences between the model and the data. Let's build this sort of bottom up as opposed to top down, which is here. Model and data, right? So you'll have, you can imagine that this part here, right? These two matrices together, that's a model, right? I have, this is this here. This is a model, beta 1, f1, x, 
up till beta and fnx. This is something that I'm saying. Y doesn't necessarily need to ascribe to that model. Y is the experimental measurement I made. I'm just saying that Y probably follows this model, right? So AB, in other words, is the model part of this equation. And Y is actually the data I've made, right? So this is actually never an e actual equal to sign as we talked about, right? You're never going to be able to find a perfect solution. So if you take the difference of your model and data, which means the difference between Y and AB, literally, and then you square it, right, at each data point, and then you sum it, right? You sort of, again, going back to the Excel analogy, when you fit a line to, the data point, to your data points, at each value of the dependent variable, take the difference between the line prediction and the actual data point, square it, and then sum it. That's the, the, the parameters that you calculate in Excel have minimized the sum of that squared difference. That's how linear parameter estimation works. There are many different forms of it, but the simplest one is this, okay? It's called minimizing the sum of squared, residue, um, squared differences, okay? And the derivation is in your reading if you want to get to it, but once you've said, right, once you've said my, that my objective is to minimize the sum of squared differences between the model and data, then basically you're in the world of differential calculus, right? Right? You're minimizing something, right? We've all done this, right? So you can, you know, you can take the derivative, set it equal to zero, and this is a solution that pops out for B. And this is in matrix form now. So A is the matrix that's here, and Y is a vector here. And that's it, right? It's called the ordinary least square solution. We'll contrast it with something else later. But this is called the ordinary least square solution. Nothing too fancy. In MATLAB, very liberating, very liberating. A backslash Y. That is it. That's the power of matrix notation. You know in Excel how you have to just go fit trend line and then show equations, blah, blah, blah. MATLAB, it's just this. Okay, now let's talk about some details. When you, when you come up with this solution, right, as being the least square solution, you make several assumptions in the derivation, okay? And these assumptions are here. You can read through them on your free time. I'm going to talk about, so just the gist of it is, things like, I know the values of x exactly. That's an assumption made in linear regression. So y I know has some noise associated with it, my experimental measurements, but I know x exactly. That's an assumption that's made. Another assumption that's made in ordinary least squares at least is that the variance of y, so the noise in y is independent of my de independent variable or x. That's another assumption that's made. And another assumption that's made is that the model actually holds, obviously. Another assumption that's made is that you're doing random sampling for y. Another assumption that, that is made, important one, is that the noise in y is Gaussian, which is, and it has zero mean, and a constant variance sigma squared. These are all a lot of assumptions that are made. Another assumption that the different measurements that are made, they have no covariance, which means that um, there's no correlation between two y values that you measure. The noise isn't correlated. Okay, the point is not to emphasize here these assumptions. I think it will just go back, read them, sort of think about them, then you'll understand these assumptions. The point is not for me to belabor them too much here. I want you to realize that there are many assumptions that are made in this process. I also want to think about whenever you're doing that Excel fitting and like getting a line or just doing any kind of linear regression, I want you to think about whether sort of these assumptions hold in the context of your problem. Many times, I don't, I'm guilty of this. A lot of us don't even think about whether the data that we have acquired, whether the no noise in that data is Gaussian. We just assume it, right? But actually, when we do that fitting of the line, we are assuming all these things very actively. So it's, that's why it's important to know that there are many assumptions that are made. And just to give you a general flavor, I'm not gonna belabor this too much again, just to give you a general flavor of where these assumptions come from, it is actually that when, you're, when you say that I'm gonna use the sum of squared differences to come up with this solution, you already have made a lot of these assumptions. Why is that? So say I measured something yi, right? This is just the equation for a Gaussian. So I'm saying that, that this yi came from a Gaussian distribution, right? And all I can look at my data is saying, give me the, 
probability, right, of having measured everything that I've measured. That's, and so basically, what that means, this is a probability you know from the Gaussian distribution, right? And so I can just take the product of all these probabilities of having measured what I measured, right? And then if I try and maximize that probability, that is equivalent to me saying, that is equivalent to me saying that the data that I'm seeing, it's most likely that it has come from this model described by eta, right? This, again, to reiterate, is the probability of having measured by i given that the actual value of yi was eta i, which is described by the model that I have. And then if you take the product of all of this to account for all the data points that you have, and then you try and maximize that product, right? That's maximizing likelihood. That's what's called maximum likelihood. And what you can see here, what I want you to see here, is that when you take this product and you take the log of it, right, then this pops out. This term, sum of squared differences. And so what you do is you maximize the probability, or you maximize the log of it, and that's where you get minimize the sum of square differences because there's a negative sign. Okay? So when you do that, that's where all these assumptions are made. And then once you've said, okay, now I'm going to go in with this objective criterion, now I can calculate my formula for B. So that's where a lot of these assumptions come in. Does that make sense? So, again, um, So if, in case you were curious where sum of squared differences comes from. I want to talk about the fact that linear regression is very, very commonly used, and it's very useful. The three characters, right, A backslash Y, it's very useful. So you have tons of examples in your reading. I hopefully you enjoyed those examples about the hemoglobin curve, about platelets, about a bunch of examples I saw. Also, I don't know, you took Marx's class last quarter, so just to reiterate again, flux balance analysis could be viewed as linear regression. Right? So just keep that in mind. It's a linear problem, flux balance analysis. That's why everybody loves it, because it's linear, it's easy to solve. Um, of course, a very useful framework. Hard part of linear regression is being able to come up with this. For a given problem, right, you have, you have a problem that you're working with. To be able to put everything in this form is what is hard in linear regression, right? You know, it's easy when you have just one time variable and one experimental variable, but you can imagine there, when there are thousands of these experimental variables. You can do, there are a lot of cool tricks and techniques that you can do to actually put your data in the form of y is equal to ab, which will, of course, make your life faster. And in your reading, there's this talk of linearization, right? Right, which is about, so for example, if you're working with an exponential curve, right? So I have an exponential curve of the form A naught times exponential to the power minus A one T, where A naught and A one are unknown parameters, right? A naught times E to the power minus A one T. I have that. If I take the log of it, then that becomes natural log of A naught minus A one times T, right? And now you have linearity. Because ln a naught can be thought of as one parameter, and a one can be thought of as the other parameter. Your your equation is linear in parameters, and I'm going to just show that in case that's not clear. Going back to the radio wave data that we got from Data Thief, right? So here's a script I wrote. It's uploaded on SpinetX. So basically, here's the math for it. The model say in that case, the model, the data that I got, say this data. I want to model it as an exponential. It seems reasonable. It looks like ex exponential data to me, right? So the model for this might be something like y naught times x minus kt, right? Which can be linearized to ln y is ln y naught minus kt, right? This makes sense to everybody, right? And now you realize that this is just beta naught plus beta 1x, right? That's what it is. It's mx plus y, uh, mx plus c. y is equal to mx plus c. It's linear, right? I'm linear now. Earlier I wasn't linear in this parameter k because I had exponential. Now I'm linear in the parameter k, right? So all I have to do, do is take a logarith, um, is to take the natural log of all my experimental measurements, and then I'm set, right? So, so you can get ax is equal to b or y is equal to ab in my other notation, where b is ln y. You take the natural log of your experimental measurements. A is ones 
minus t. So how does this make sense? If you do matrix multiplication here, x looks like ln y naught and k. So you have ln y naught multiplied by one minus kt, and you do that for every data point. And then you recover all your y values. Does, that, does this make sense? Should I spend more time on this? Is this confusing for people? Yeah. Should I write on the whiteboard? Maybe that's helpful here. Say you have your A matrix here, have just one, 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 and this is my ln by, and this is a vector by the way, right? And then this is say minus, so minus t1, minus t2, minus t3, one, and then my parameters are ln y of zero, Do the matrix multiplication there, right? Then y naught minus kt1 is ln y1, ln y2 is ln y naught minus kt2. Again, it's about recognizing how your problem becomes y is equal to kx. And then, so that makes sense? So just to go back from the beginning of the script, what I'm doing, I'm just loading the data. I rescale the x-axis because if you know, the time there starts at 500 milliseconds or something. I want to, of course, start at zero milliseconds, right? That's when this equation holds. So I rescale everything. I can plot it. And then finally, I do this. I, I just, this is my A matrix. This is my B matrix. Just taking logs here in a parameter estimation, right? And then I'm going to display my results. Your reading goes through polyfit. I'm not going to talk about it right now, but that's another way to do this. Data fit, good, right? And these are parameter values that came out. Buffer two, okay? Question. Yes. Both, right? It has to be, right? And so also, like, Right, so sometimes in papers you have really thick traces. If you have really thick traces, yeah. then of course it's gonna, right. And so, I mean, I'm not, data thief is not work that you do and then go publish. Data thief is work that you do to like try and find loopholes and things that are out there or try and really understand what's out there, right? To try and make mathematical sense of what's going on. Um, okay, so. You get a bit that we saw an example of linear regression, right? And now we can study, right? What is the implication of this? We can actually study how these nanoparticles might be working in an in vivo system, right? Going back to where the paper was, what the paper was talking about, we can start talking about how quickly they cool because that's what this decay constant means here, right? We have a number for that. That's cool. Right. Um, get the time constant value, basically. Okay. So linear regression, super important, super important. But assumptions involved, we talked about solutions, we talked about hard part being putting it in this form. The last 10 minutes or so, I'm not gonna belabor this again too much. Again, this is a huge topic. I can't possibly cover everything in this. I mentioned earlier, the, there's, so the parameters that I've calculated, right? These two parameter values, I got them here. They themselves are noisy, right? If my data is noisy, then these parameter estimates themselves are going to be noisy. If my data changes a little, these parameter estimates are going to change. Hopefully not by too much, but they are going to change a little bit. The good thing about linear regression as opposed to nonlinear regression is that the error in these parameter estimates can be pinpointed to by just a formula. You can, and I'm not, the reading goes through some of these formulae. I, at this point, like given how much time we have allocated, we're not going to see these formulae. I, all I want you to realize is that these formulae exist. And so if you start getting into linear regression, you know that you can go and find these formulae. It's important to be able to, to know those things if you're doing this. R squared value, we've all seen this in Excel. And hopefully this will finally help you understand what R squared means. R squared means I take my data and I fit a line to it, and then I compare how well a flat line fit that data. That's actually the interpretation of R squared. So again, I got, I got some data, right? And I fit a line to that data, and I compare how much the data differs from this line as opposed to how much the data differ, differs from this line. That's what gives me R squared. 
Now you can think about what that means when you see the article that fun, which means everything is awesome. But what that really means is up for question, right? Because you can imagine that, so, so, right, so you can imagine that your model may not be as good as you would like it to be, right? The fits may not look as good, but your R squared value may be very high because the fit with a horizontal line looks horrible, right? So that's something worth thinking about. That's the, that's the numerator. This, this, the denominator is the horizontal line. So it's the denominator here says y minus y mean all squared. And the horizontal line is nothing but the mean of your data. So good to know, right, what r squared actually means. Okay. Um, then I'm not going again, not spending too much time on this, but we talked about OLS, which required, which had this assumption, if you remember, it was like assumption two or something, that every by i is normally distributed, the variance is independent of x. That's an assumption that's made in ordinary least squares, but what if it's not true, right? That assumption is not true. Radioactive decay is a Poisson process, which means that the variance depends on the mean, Right, which means that as you're decaying over time, your variance is going to change. Very simple process, and I can't even use OLS to model this. So there's this thing called weighted least squares, where I can say, where I can attribute weights to different data points. Basically, the intuition here is that if a data point is noisy, I can tell my regression that this data point's noisy, so hold off. Don't rely on it too much. The data points that are less noisy rely on it a lot. Right? And the way that works is going back to this sort of likelihood thing. If this sigma squared just gets replaced by sigma i squared, sigma i squared, then I weighted least squared. <laughs> That's it. I just replace the sigma squared with sigma i squared because now my variance changes with each data point. Right? And so in matrix form, when you look at a solution, you basically, this is very similar to the solution that we looked at above, except this weighting matrix has been introduced. And that weighting matrix may have a form in an ideal situation like this, where the, this one over sigma, this di, it's a diagonal matrix, so which means only the diagonal values have non-zero uh, non values. And so this one over sigma one squared, again, I'm not gonna go into the derivation, but it comes from the fact that you have this sigma i squared here. And you can look at the derivation on the internet or something like that. But I just want you to be aware that we can deal with situations like this through a technique called WLS, and that's to account for noise, which is varying throughout your data set. And then you can still use linear regression if you wanted to. And it'll give you a better, because, because, because of the assumptions that have been made, of course, OLS doesn't hold, but WLS will then in that case. Again, um, does that make sense generally? I mean, we're not gonna get into the math of this right now, but I want to, the takeaway has to be that we call WLS, which can be used when noise is varying throughout your data set. And then there's a formula for that in linear regression. And WLS and implementing it, this is, as I mentioned, in an ideal scenario, sometimes you have to come up with weights of your own and so on. That's what WLS entails in computing. Okay. Final thing. Um, linear param we haven't talked about this thing where, what if I want to solve two linear parameter estimations at the same time, right? So what if, what if I want a solution to y is equal to ax while wanting, or y is equal to ab as I had, while demanding that every value of b in there should be positive. I didn't demand that right now. I said give me any parameter vector b, right? So if I want that, there's a way to do that in linear parameter estimation, and you should take like more class at Stanford if you're getting interested by this stuff. Um, for that specific problem in MATLAB, you have something called LSQ non-neg, so that's like the shortcut for now. You can also implement your own formulae in matrix form to do that. But there are some other LSCOV, LSQ non-neg, these are some other linear optimization tools that are in MATLAB. In Marcus's class, I'm sure you looked at simplex a little bit because are, are just some variant of, uh, of getting parameters from flux balance. Is that, is that familiar? Do you guys do simplex? But linear programming in general, you sort of got introduced to some linear programming, right? In prog, yeah, linear programming, yep. Yeah, but, um, but so, so, but, um, Right, so 
This is just we've done, we have not made any demands on our parameter vector b right now, but you can imagine that there are a lot of demands that we can make, right? If you're calculating, say, fluxes that you need, know must be positive, then you can't have b coming out negative. So you have to put constraints on the system. And when the problem gets too complicated, then you go start going to things like Quinthog or something. In simple cases, you can still use like LSQ nonnic, for example, or something like that. Help these commands in MATLAB to figure out what these functions do. Hopefully they'll be useful.